Our scripture reading this morning comes from Mark's Gospel in the 8th chapter. Be reading the first 21 verses. Mark 8. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves. And having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And, after, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them and got into the boat again and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they only had one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basket full, baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, we are uh, blind and deaf to it if we, uh, without the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask now that your spirit come and unstop our ears and open our eyes and soften our hearts to the message you have for us. In your name we ask. Amen. Well, as we read this passage, it's sort of like deja vu all over again, isn't it? You remember back, I think it was in chapter 6. If you don't, you have your Bible open, just turn back a page probably, and you'll see it there where Jesus fed the 5,000. Now, there are some in, who say that this uh, second feeding points to the fact that the scriptures are uh, made up that they are legend and mythology. They say, see, somewhere, sometime, some scribe, someplace, uh, put this in twice, they made a mistake, or Peter, who's dictating this gospel to, uh, to Mark, you know, his memory must have been faulty. Um, I find such conjecture basically nonsense, and I bring it up to you this morning, though, because every commentary I found had something to say about it, and they're smarter than I am on these things. But I could spend probably 10 minutes or so sorting out all the different reasons uh, and di the differences between the two feedings and how they're alike, and, and for your comfort and enjoyment, I will not do that, okay? Uh, I've come to the point in reading this that, and in my life that if you want a reason not to believe, if you want a reason to throw rocks at scripture, you're going to find it. You're going to find it. If you came here today and you wanted a reason not to believe in Christ, you probably found a half a dozen already, and I'm sure that you'll find another one before I get through preaching because 
as you've already seen this morning, I can insert my foot in my mouth in a real big way. You know, so it's, it's going to happen. You know, and nobody has ever been argued into the kingdom of God anyway, have they? It takes the word of God through the spirit of God by the power of God to convict them and to bring them to Christ. So all we can do is sow seed. Well, the question is, what do you do with somebody who points this out? See, you've got two feedings there. This is nonsense. Well, one th for one thing, miracles that involve feedings of thousands of people from a few loaves and some fish, that's pretty memorable, isn't it? If it only happened once, you're going to remember, hey, this happened once. And if it happened twice, you're going to remember that it happened twice. You know, so this, this thinking, this idea that Peter's memory was faulty or that some scribe somewhere slipped up, I think is just basically ludicrous. There's also the discussion that follows there in verses 17 through 21 in the boat with, between Jesus and the disciples where Jesus asks some very specific questions about the two separate miracles. So if the two miracles are uh, made up or are, 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 aren't right, then this conversation on the boat is a total fabrication as well. And if that's a total fabrication, let's fold up and go home. Amen. Because then the scripture is faulty. We have nothing to trust in. So I don't think any of this stuff holds up. And I'm glad we've got that out of the way. Let's move on. Uh, Let's sort of take a bird's eye view. Let's fly over this at 30,000 feet and get some context. You know, you've got, the, you've got what's going on here. It's, it's happened before. There's a feeding of a large number of people, a confrontation with the Pharisees, a teaching to the disciples, and then a healing. That's what's happened in the previous chapter. And then Mark does it again here. He's getting us ready for something. He's getting us ready for the pivotal point in his gospel, which is when Christ uh, asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And Jesus responds, and, and Peter responds, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But before that can happen, before anyone can see who Christ is, what happened? has to happen. Their ears have to be healed. They have to be unstopped like he healed the deaf mute. And their eyes have to be opened. We didn't read it this morning, but it picks up in verse 22 where he heals the blind man. So, we're, Mark is telling us something here about Christ, about who he is. And so we have a, this context around us. And I think it helps us to understand all of this. So we have this going on. And Jesus, you know, the, the Pharisees come here and they ask him for this sign. Uh, and they've witnessed this feeding of 4,000 people. And the disciples are still mixed up. And he says, do you still not understand but anyway verses 10 through 13 there's this crowd 4,000 people Jesus sends them on their way they get in the boat and they come to the other side to the district of Dalmanutha and he barely gets out of the boat and uh, and the Pharisees are all over him they begin they begin to argue with him seeking from him a sign uh, from heaven to test him now, the English word test, I think it's uh, tempting in the KJV. It doesn't really convey the animosity that the Pharisees have for Jesus. And we know that animosity. It's been brewing since the third chapter. Remember, Jesus healed the man with the withered hand there. And after that confrontation, after that happened, I think it's verse 6 where they go out and they begin to plot how they might kill him with the Herodians. They plot with them. So the Pharisees aren't seeking to have some sort of polite theological discussion with Jesus here. They're hostile toward him. And this hostility is expressed in this demand for a sign. Prove to us that you really are from God, Jesus. Prove it. And Jesus expresses deep sorrow at their, at their bitter opposition. You know, and, and to, that these men have. And he does so with a deep sigh. And to me, that speaks to the eyewitness account, doesn't it? I mean, if you're writing a myth and a legend, you don't, you're here, you don't talk about he or she sighing all the time, do you? This is the second time we've had a sigh. No, Peter said, you should have seen Jesus, Mark, 
when these people said that to him. It was just, <sighs> you know, so he sighs deeply. How many signs do you need? What do you want? People have been healed. I've cast out demons. I've fed thousands of people with a few loaves and some fish. I have been compassionate. I have been kind. I have been loving. I have shown my grace. I have shown grace to you. And if they did not recognize that this was the way that God was revealing himself in his son, Jesus Christ, then they would have to remain blind. People these days still want a sign, don't they? God, just show me something. They cry out to heaven. Lord, if you're real, do this or do that. You know, and we want a sign. Well, let's say God gave us a sign. Let's say that there is a woman down here at Kikers, and she gets up, and she walks down the aisle here, right down here, and, and she sits down up front here. You know what we'd be saying? Isn't it awful how those doctors down there at Rome Medical Center didn't diagnose her properly, and she had to go through all of that? That's just terrible. How could they say she was dead when she was really alive? That's what people would say. And you smile because you know that's true. You know it's true. Jesus, I think it's in Luke's Gospel, the 16th chapter, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, and, and the rich man dies, and he's down there, go send somebody to my brothers. They'll believe that somebody rises from the dead. And Jesus says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. If you don't believe the word of God, you're not going to believe any sign from God, not even the resurrection of someone from the dead. Amen. And friend, if you want a real miracle, here's, in my opinion, the real miracle. Amen. It's your Bible. It's the Word of God. You think about it. Two million, different wor two million words, 40 different authors, 1,500 years of Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, and every jot and every tittle, divinely inspired, written by men that were carried along, the scriptures tell us, by the Spirit of God. That the Bible has been preserved all through these centuries with the singular care and grace and providence of God. That's a miracle. And you can hold it in your hand. Not everybody in this world can hold it in their hand. People died, were burned at the stake, and shed their blood. So you could have a Bible this morning. So don't let it collect dust. It's the word of God, supervised by God, telling me everything I need to know to be forgiven of my sins, telling me how I can come to know Christ as Lord and Savior, telling me how I can live my life for him as a Christian. That's a miracle that we even have it today. Verse 13, and he left them, left the Pharisees, he got into the boat again, and he went to the other side. Jesus likes boat trips. There's a lot of boat trips in Mark there, isn't there? And th he does this a lot. Uh, and that might seem like a simple detail in the story, you know, that he gets into the boat and he goes to the other side. But you think about it. He sighs deeply. No sign will be given. He gets in the boat. He leaves. I think the three are tied together. The sighing, the statement, and the leaving. Jesus sighing. Here is the display of dismay it can be a display of anger a display of despair and the greek word translated size deeply it describes someone who's been they've been pushed to the limit of their faithfulness pushed to the limit of their patience and the bible speaks often of the patience of god his long suffering but you know i looked and i couldn't find anywhere where the bible says that god's patience is infinite Although I did find Genesis 6-3 where it says, the Lord says, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. And what happened after that? The flood, the judgment of God. There comes a point where God will leave a person in their sin. If we repeatedly and unrepentantly choose to go our own way and choose our sin and stubbornly do so, Romans 8 or Romans 1, verse 28, and actually three times in that first chapter of Romans, it tells us God gave them over. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. You looking for reasons not to believe? 
You can have them. The Pharisees refuse to have their eyes opened, refuse to have their ears unstopped. They're not interested in signs. They're not interested in miracles. What they're interested in is confirming their own unbelief. So what does Jesus do? He gets in a boat and he leaves. And this leaving is not like the sending away of the crowd earlier that he fed. That, that sending away of the crowd earlier was one of, of care, of love, because, you know, they had been satisfied, I guess, it, basically in that physical sense and in the teaching sense. But this leaving here is akin to, you remember, Jesus sent out the disciples and he tells them if they will not receive your teaching, take your sandals off and shake the dust off of them and go your way. That's what this is. It's a testimony against them. And he says there that it will be more tolerable in the, in, for Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than it will be for that city. That's what he tells the disciples. So Jesus, through his actions, is here is saying, you don't believe what I'm saying? You don't believe the truth that I'm sharing? I'll be on my way. I'll be on my way. And that's a point for us to witness. We don't have to be rude. We don't have to be mean. But we sow the seed. You don't want to believe? That's up to God. In the spirit of God. It's not up to me. So Jesus gets in the boat with the disciples. And I imagine, you know, so I read and I imagine things. Uh, and if I can't imagine, I just pretend, you know, like kids do. But that he had a place of his own in the boat. I remember earlier, you know, he's in the back of the boat. He's on a cushion and he's sleeping, so it's not too much of a stretch. Uh, but he doesn't get any sleep this time. The guys, the disciples, are huddled together and they're talking. And Jesus listens a little more closely and they're talking about all things of bread. You'd think they'd be tired of talking about bread. They're swimming in bread and all of this. You know, they say... Uh, you were supposed to pack the lunch. No, Peter's turn to pack the lunch. Well, who left the picnic basket on the bank? Who left it over there? We got in the boat. We left. You know, where's the lunch? You know, all we've got is this one loaf of bread. Jesus seizes the moment, a teaching moment. Watch out. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And then in verse 16, the disciples apparently look at each other and decide, well, you know, Jesus is upset about not having lunch either. You know, he's concerned about this as well. You know, there's only this one small loaf of wonder bread here, and there's 13 of us. What are we going to do? Do you see the pictures? Picture here? The disciples are sitting in the boat with the Lord of glory, but they don't see him, and they don't hear him. Have they forgotten? 5,000 people, or I guess if you total it all up, 9,000 plus people, 17 baskets of leftovers, and you're worried that you're going to get fed? Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not understand? Do you not perceive? Are your hearts hard? You have eyes, but you don't see. You have ears, but you don't hear. And then he goes into the questions. Don't you remember what happened? How many loaves were there with the 5,000? You know, and how many with the four? And how much did you pick up? You know, do you not understand? Don't you get it, guys? Don't you remember who's in the boat with you? You know, I'm the one, remember we were in the boat and the, and, and the wind and the waves were about ready to swamp us and I got up and said, peace, be still. I'm the one who blessed the loaves, 9,000 people fed, and you had so many leftovers you were tired of picking up bread at the end of the day. And now you're worried about one loaf? The disciples were so caught up in the problems of this world that they'd forgotten about the love and care of Jesus, hadn't they? They had forgotten that he had provided for them every step of the way. We do that, don't we? Everything's happening. Everything's coming down on me. I, I don't understand why I'm having all these problems. Jesus is in the boat with you. He's right there with you. He's in the struggle with you. You know, are you here this morning, beloved, and are you caught up in the problems and the circumstances of your life, wrapped up in the difficulties that have come your way? You know, I think about this, and it occurs to me, you know, that the loaf of bread, 
You know, they could have looked at it and said, well, you know what this really is. It's just a sign that Christ is going to take care of us, whether we have one loaf of bread or no loaves of bread. You know, the old hymn, uh, it's in Come Thou Found of Every Blessing, the old writing of it, Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. And we hear that in 21st century ears and we go, what? Why is he talking about Ebenezer Scrooge? You know, but in Ebenezer, in the scripture, it's 1 Samuel. I can't come up with chapter and verse, but it's a symbol that hither by your help we've come. Well, the Lord used bread in the past, and I have a loaf of bread, and it's going to get me here. I curse this cane sometimes, but you know what? It's a symbol to me that God has brought me hither to by his help. Amen. And he's going to see me down the road. He's in the boat. He's in the boat with you. Amen. He's caring for you. He's brought you safely to this point. Jesus not only lets the disciples know that when he says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod, it doesn't deal with earthly bread. He lets them know it's got to do with the hardness of your heart. Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? Are your hearts that hard? That's some pretty pointed questions. Those are hard questions. What's he getting at here? He wants the disciples to understand who he is. He wants them to understand what he is teaching them because that's what he's doing. He's teaching them. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. And they fail to understand those things. If they fail to understand the teaching, if they fail to believe, their hearts will be hardened. You see, the unbelief of the Pharisees blossomed in the midst of their false teaching. Remember back when we talked about that, they wanted to wash their hands and wash the pots and the pans and the kettles. And if you didn't wash your hands and the pots and the pans and the kettles the way they did, I'm going to swat you down. You're no good. And Jesus says, you get a hard heart that way. Being led astray uh, and not understanding my teaching, you have a hard heart and you can start to behave that way. And we can do the same thing. Remember, they're in the boat with Jesus. They're there with him. And you see, that's what we have to remember. That's what false teaching leads to. That's what it does. I know people who are thousands of miles away from the gospel that they professed in their early 20s today. They're thousands of miles away from it. And they're thousands of miles away from it because they believe stuff like what I talked about earlier this morning. Oh, so that part of the Bible is not true. Well, if that part's not true, then we'll pick up someplace over here. I don't like what Paul says here about this, or Paul says here about that, or this or that. And then they make a gospel unto themselves, and they make a God unto themselves, and they make an idol. I don't like God this way. I don't like God that way. I like to think about God like this. I got news for you. The Bible is the one who teaches us about, that teaches us about who God is. And if you don't like something about the God of the Bible, guess who needs to change? Amen. We are to be a people under the authority of Scripture. We are not to place Scripture under our authority. Amen. We are to live by the word of God. And this unbelief and this false teaching, it's the yeast. It's the yeast that he's talking about. And it infects the entire loaf. And it matters, beloved. It matters who you read, and it matters who you listen to. It matters what you're taught. And if you hear me say something that doesn't ring true, you, you hold me accountable. You know, it matters. That's why we, as a session, that's, you know, we, we're putting out the catechism questions to the Sunday school. They're on the back of your bulletin. It's not just something to be doing. It's we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to shepherd the sheep. We have a responsibility to feed the sheep the word of God. And you need to know that God. And you say, well, I memorized the Bible. That's great. I want you to memorize the Bible. But if you memorize the Bible verses and you don't know what they mean, you just got, you might as well say Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. We need to understand. We need to have a theology we need to understand what's going here, what holds everything together, or else we'll find ourselves doing what the disciples did in the boat, looking at our circumstances and not at the Lord Jesus. Amen. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. 
Jesus says, beware the leaven of unbelief. Beware those things because it will lead to a hardness of heart. Beware of that leaven that constantly looks to yourself to get yourself out of your own problems and out of your own difficulties. We must look to Christ. Look at the language uh, Jesus uses here. Having eyes you cannot see, having ears you cannot hear. I read that just this morning uh, in, uh, I think it was Jeremiah chapter 5. It's that language, it's that prophetic language that's going on there. Mark's you, Jesus has used these words before, I think it was the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And when he uses them there, he's talking to unbelievers. Unbelievers. Those who are outside of the covenant. And now here in chapter 8, he's applying these words to who? The disciples. The guys in the boat with him. Do you see what Jesus is saying? The disciples, in spite of their proximity to Jesus, in spite of being with him all of this time, in spite of them being wrapped in the boat, they're so wrapped up in themselves that they're behaving like they're not even believers. That's, that's how they're acting. Jesus is, it's as if he were saying, when you quarrel this way, when you fight among yourselves this way, when you get me out of the picture, when you set aside my teaching and you behave like this, it's as though you're not believers at all. And we in the church can get to looking like the world awfully fast when we get our eyes off of, a, off of Christ and onto ourselves and say, well, why did he do this and why did she do that and yammer about this and yammer about that. That's what the world does. Let's look to Christ. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. When you get your eyes off of Christ, when we get our eyes off the teaching, when we set aside sound doctrine, that's when the trouble starts. That's when we slide downhill. Now to this point, we've talked about, if you will, the forgetfulness of, of, of the disciples, forgetfulness of Jesus and his care for them, and we've talked about their hardness of heart. We'll close now talking about their lack of perception. Do you not understand? Don't you get it, guys? After all you've seen and after all you've heard, after all you've witnessed, don't you get it? You know, the disciples would have known the Old Testament and maybe they thought of this verse uh, when Jesus fed the 5,000, when he fed the 4,000 from Isaiah 55, Come, everyone who thirst, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And why do you labor for that which does not satisfy? And here's Jesus giving them bread, and it has all kinds of messianic overtones. He's saying to them, when, it, when Messiah comes, this is what he will do. The eyes, you got, what, did he, what did the people come back and they ask, uh, they send from, John, John sends them from prison, go ask him, you know, are you really the one? John has some doubts there in prison. He goes, you go tell John that the blind are healed, the, the lame are made to walk, the hungry are fed. That's how you know, that's how he'll know. Don't you get it, Jesus says. Don't you know, understand who I am? Don't you understand the implications of what it is that I'm doing and what it is that I'm saying? Because if you understood who I really am, you wouldn't be acting this way. You wouldn't be quarreling this way. You wouldn't be accusing each other this way. You wouldn't be constantly pushing me out of the picture in this way. You wouldn't be so uh, constantly discontent with who you are and where you are. What difference... Does it make this morning that Jesus is our Lord and Savior? Amen. Amen. All the difference in the world. Who is this Jesus that we believe in? Who is this Jesus that we've come to worship, sing praises to, and, and pray to this morning? Is he the Son of God, as Mark says in the opening chapter of his gospel? Because if he is the Son of God, as Becky said, it makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? It changes everything. It's not 
that if the disciples in the boat had recognized who Jesus was and heard who he was, that, that he would give them, I don't know, a, a, a sanctified happy meal or something like that. It, it's not anything like that at all. It's that if they had recognized who Jesus was, that there would be, uh, and it's not that if they recognized who Jesus was that there wouldn't be any trials, that there wouldn't be any struggles. It doesn't say that. It do, I think it's saying this, that through the trials and through the struggles and through the difficulties, you have your eyes in the right place. We only have one loaf of bread. Don't look at the bread, look at Jesus. Look, at, look to Christ. See him. And you can persevere to the end. You know, if the theme of last week's message, dealing with the man who was deaf, remember that? You might, you might not remember. Sometimes I think you forget a sermon as soon as you stand up, and I need to forget it as soon as I step down. But, <laughs> but, but do you remember it from last week? You remember that? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Well, I think today's might be, can you see me now? Because what's he do immediately after this? He heals the blind man. Do you really see who I am, Jesus asked. Because if you could see who I am, you wouldn't be concerned about the fact that you only have one loaf of bread. That would be the least significant thing on your list. Can you see him now? Can you see him? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your gracious son. Lord, may we ever turn our eyes upon you. Lord, we seem to stumble and fall over and over again. Lord, we feel ourselves to be so much like these disciples who've had so many blessings, and yet we turn and uh, we fall into despair. Lord, help us to discern here uh, our Lord and Master's warning to us of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Lord, forgive us of our uh, propensity to forget you, of our inability to perceive and to focus on who Jesus really is. Grow us up in your grace, we pray this morning. Refocus our minds and our hearts and our wills and our affections, Father, that we might see no one but your Son, Jesus Christ. For we ask for his sake and his, his name. Amen. the Lord.